The Kronovori Bridge is set to become a landmark in Finland, its longest bridge and the tallest structure in Helsinki. As one of the three crown bridges, it will serve the city's new tramway line and provide dedicated lanes for pedestrians and cyclists. Notably, no cars will be allowed on these bridges, reflecting Helsinki's forward-thinking urban mobility plans. The project began with an international design competition in 2012 and is expected to be completed in 2027. In this video, we speak with key players in the project, representatives from the city of Helsinki, WSP Finland, UK-based Knight Architects and the general contractor YIT. They share insights on the project's ambitions, challenges, cutting-edge technologies and valuable lessons learned along the way. The uh, project is, is one of the first parts of the uh, of that light rail network. We are responsible for the whole state from, from the uh, master plan phase to the operational phase. Uh, the goal is, is to, to have the network ready by roughly 2050. Uh, got this wonderful brief from the client. Uh, a beautiful book was was presented to us in in a little box, a hard bound book. It was lovely because um, normally competition briefs are uh, an email, uh, a PDF, and often they're poorly written. But this was probably the best. Still today, I would say one of the best competition briefs we've ever ever received uh, in its form and its content, and it really set the tone for the whole competition and and indeed the whole project. We wanted to develop a, a concept that would be landmark for Helsinki. When you come by air or, or by ship, you will know that you are now in Helsinki. So this is a, a sort of wow. But uh, I think that we very we were very strict on that when we were developing a structural concept that should, it should make sense. And uh, I think that we were quite successful in that in our goal, the concept that we created together with uh, Knight Architects for the bridge, uh, one high single tower and uh, two equal uh, cable spans. It's very nice concept and uh, that's a way very demanding uh, and it, it has been very nice during these, uh, say, 13 years to see how it comes true. The wonderful idea is now coming true. My employer, YIT LTD, and our excellent partner, Create LTD, make a consortium together to build this bridge. The bridge construction itself started in September 2021, and we should be quite ready in, at the end of 2025. Design service life for the Kronovoren Silta should be 200 years. And this is exceptional. And this is uh, innovative <laughs> and very big challenge, of course, for us as a designers, but also for those who are making constructions. Um, I think a lot of the st structural challenges actually came from the ground rather than the height. Um, Sami may correct me on, on this, but the, uh, the bedrock um that sits underneath the the water um drops away quite steeply um before coming back to form the two small islands just underneath where we have positioned the, the diamond um and so the land form really has influenced an awful lot where approach piers are where the main tower is and then indeed the horizontal alignment of, of the bridge has been quite influenced by the ground Wind um, would be another one. Um, so wind from a structural perspective, but also a comfort perspective. Um, I remember some wind tunnel tests looking at the influence on the cables and we've designed a parapet or a family of parapet elements that really respond to the uh, prevailing southerly wind to try and maintain comfort without creating too much enclosure. If you're in a nice warm tram, <laughs> everything's fine and you maybe experience the bridge for a minute or two. 
Uh, but if you're walking, it's probably a, a 10 minute walk and you're in the rain and in the wind. And so the, the, the parapet um, through wind tunnel testing is, is designed specifically to provide an appropriate level of comfort to the wind without creating unnecessary enclosure. By the length, this bridge uh, has a length of about uh, 1,200 meters and, and for the center pylon, the height will be 135 meters. This means that we are breaking some records in the scale inside Finland. Uh, what comes to the project management as well, we have uh, had a very strict uh, environmental uh, demands here. For example, birds nesting season or the spawning season of the fishes are some times that we have had to schedule all the works around them. Uh, also, logistics has been one major challenge because both ends of the quite long area of of the construction area are residential areas and for example when the main beams of the bridge were uh, transported here uh, they had a long length of about 30 meters by 2.5 meters so the transportation for example has been has been really demanding there, there are uh, process uh, risks for example uh, with, with the water permits environmental permits uh, and so forth that's one one big issue how, how do you uh, keep the speed up uh, uh, in, in the world where, where we are facing the ever increasing demands on, on the environmental aspects and the processes of, of the permits the other issue is, is the ever evolving surrounding area we are building in, in, in ten dense city cent center where, where the surroundings are, are, are not uh, the same in the end as they were in the beginning. Uh, and, uh, and that brings us, us to the uh, third part, which is the, the level of, of information and, and technology, which are also changing. Uh, we are living in, in, in a changing world where the te technology uh, and, and amount of information when we began, began the project is, is only a small, small fraction of the, uh, of the amount of, of information in, in the end of the process. So the, all of the uh, world, in a way, is changing as we go on. The client wanted the bridge to have a 200-year design life and that's more than usual 120 being typical and um, actually quite an interesting challenge from a sustainability perspective because it leads you to creating more robustness um, more robustness against corrosion more uh, robustness against all the changes that may happen in the future <laughs> um, so the deck can be reconfigured to take different modes of transport if that is necessary within two centuries. You know, the things that we don't know that may change. Um, but it saves what could be, you know, an entire additional bridge needing to be built in 120 years time. Over 200 years here, that initial spend of carbon will be spent on achieving some fantastic sustainable outcomes. The influence of that carbon has, will be wonderful in changing the way people move. And it's incredibly difficult to measure, and not many people do, but we should. And I think if you look at the carbon saved from all the journeys not traveled, uh, vehicular journeys not traveled, those emissions not emitted because people are cycling rather than driving, even beyond that, if you look at the carbon that is saved by a denser urban realm in Kronobura, Ranta than would be possible if it was a vehicle dominated new development. When you come to that question, you have to start uh, thinking uh, what does it mean if you have a life cycle requirement for 200 years? And uh, I think that you, when you start to think about that, you quite soon realize that you have to have good materials, good working, good design. And some of these improvements that you have to make if you step from 100 to 200 years, they don't cost anything. Perhaps you have to think about them, how to do this better. But at the end of the day, uh, I think that if you want to have a better uh, concrete, 
it will cost a little bit more and you have to use a little bit more reinforcement in concrete structure and uh, they have to be stainless steel perhaps so my my answer is yes you have to invest a little bit more if you want to make it last longer all of these concrete masses for this bridge has been designed all over again with our suppliers to meet these very high demands. Uh, for another example, we use a lot of high tensile strength steels and also RST steels, which is uh, not, uh, not normal. Uh, as an example, from the pylon behind me, for example, there are some segments in the pylon where, where the reinforcement thickness is about 350 kilograms per cubic meter and this has led to some some innovations for example we have uh, used a lot of self-seeming concrete in the pylon uh, construction and and these are also some recipes that uh, that had been customized for the specific and high needs it was 2015-16 that we were starting to do uh, detail design and at that time uh, this kind of modeling techniques they were quite new and was, was never used in such a scale that we were doing so that uh, all the disciplines uh, made their own designs by BIM and then we put them all together to collaboration models and this was very we were very pioneers on that that thing. It's it's a kind of standard practice nowadays, but you have to do it first once to learn how to use it. Uh, the way we now do it is so called. Uh, you can have a m many kind of terms. One is adaptive uh, modeling. So if you change one little thing uh, in a in a structure, everything all the changes happen automatically. Uh, of course, you have to make a script so that you are wise enough to uh, that, that, that so that changes are easy to make. But this has changed quite a lot uh, us to do, so that we can deal all, all the changes in a sensible time and they are correct. Lots of the things already happened happens without uh, uh, without drawings when we are talking about steel fabrication. Uh, how what are the plate si sizes, shapes, and so on, and how they are welded together, we don't need. This is automatic digital process already. I would say one technological thing that has been possible on this project um, and has been very good has been a sort of centralized BIM environment. Um, the communication was one of refinement rather than optioneering, which allowed this kind of single central model even in a loose conceptual level of detail to become a kind of placeholder that digitally over the years slowly evolved to become fabrication information and um and and that's been key to certainly the latter stages of this project where we need to assess what that diamond or the parapet or the deck surfacing or the benches look like from an aesthetic perspective we need to be able to communicate that to external stakeholders and communities so that they can understand it and at the same time the engineering teams need to do finite element analysis of it wind testing and to uh, you know ultimately the fabricator needs to build it and, and to do that from one environment um yeah i think this project achieved that very well in the tender phase of the project we decided to mm, leave the cantilever installation technique of of the cable state bridge and and build the temporary supports and and then use a crane vessel to lift uh, the segments of the bridge as larger uh, pieces this also means that the pieces are on the temporary supports right now and we can build the superstructure of the bridge already uh, compared to the normal method where, where we could only do that after, after the pylon has uh, fi been finished and the, and the cable stage section is hanging on the pylon. Uh, this means about uh, one year on the critical path. The building information model is helping us all the time.
structures uh, move as the loads pile up and and in our project we have managed to model every phase we can take the modeling and compare measure and compare to that specific phase and we can quickly make sure that we are on the plan we have a con contract so that uh, we must provide every information in time right after the construction of, of that piece has has finished before we can uh, proceed to billing so I, I think technology uh, makes makes things visible I, I don't mean only only 3d visible we begin to uh, use information openly throughout the organization uh, and I can really uh, start to rely on on the information that I, I get uh, and, and we, we are learning to, to enrich information at each stage it gives openness it gives visibility to everything we do but you know re really having a joined up vision is a is a huge lesson to be learned I, th I think the main one from an architectural perspective has been for me how influential infrastructure can be and particularly in as i said in the light of the climate emergency recognizing that it's the outcomes of bridges not just the objects that are important for us to consider and then yeah as i said before it's really important as a lesson um a positive lesson to get to go into these projects with the right team with with shared values um, because uh, if you win the competition you're going to be hopefully in that team for an awfully long long time and uh, and, and i think um uh, that that's been incredibly positive from this uh, this project i would say that uh, both of our partnering companies have taken steps in digitalizations that we otherwise wouldn't have in, in let's say normal projects and it is it is our responsibility to uh, get this information and provide it further inside of our organizations that that we can really take steps uh, ahead in the long term uh, what comes to the actual concrete works i'm, I'm sure we have uh, tried so many things here and, and we have the learnings of the technical side that of the solutions that that both of the companies will surely benefit of of in the in the future projects as well uh, but all in all, I'd say, uh, no matter what the technology is, this is always a people business as well. We are adopting IPD Models Alliance project type, for example. It's not about the alliance itself, it's about the cultural change that it forces you to have. Uh, and that's also about the transparency. It's about uh, changing from, from the management culture to, a, I would say, coaching or leadership culture, where we are trusting people uh, and ensuring the, the transparency and, and making it possible for everybody to, to succeed in their work. And we are trying to bring us from the, on the same side of the table to, to solve the problems and to create value instead of, instead of creating uh, obstacles and, and arguments. We, uh, uh, construction uh, industry as whole, as a part of our society, we will face the question uh, how we manage to minimize our carbon footprint. And uh, lots of effort should be and will be done on that. Good opportunity to thank all the people that have been working with in this project with the client and my colleagues and architects and contractors. This has been a wonderful trip so far.